Hello, folks. Michael with the CCERP podcast, Deep for Ecology. Today, we have the good fortune of talking to nature guide Griff Griffith, who's joining us out in California. We're like two hours ahead. We're ahead in the future. They're behind in time out there right now. But uh, can you say hi? Introduce yourself to the folks. Hello, this is Griff. I'm uh, from Humboldt County, which is where the vast majority of the Redwoods are in Humboldt and, and Del Norte counties. Cool. And uh, I'm here on a rainy but warm Northern California day. Oh, and then, yeah, really quickly, folks, um, sorry to interrupt a little bit, but you might know Griff from some videos about a recent mountain lion sighting. It was well known. I posted some on the Facebook page, and people, um, other people in general, will know some of the Kyle story. But um, a lot of people know about Griff in that regard too. Um, but so, <clears throat> can you tell folks a little bit about your background and about yourself? Well, I have been a lifelong wildlife conservationist, and um, I grew up in the Bay Area and wanted to get out of the city as soon as possible. So I joined the California Conservation Corps um, as a youth, which is a state work program for youth. And I got to do a lot of restoration. I got fire trained. And so that led to the next hmm. 13, 14 years as a seasonal um, while I'm going to college. So I went to college like one semester a year. And then I did uh, all kinds of different wildlife surveys, fish surveys, bird surveys. I fought fires. I was on trail crews. I worked for Forest Service and Wildlife Conservation Society and the Nature Conservancy doing restoration and slowly went to school, ended up creating my own bachelor's degree, cool. which was a combination of uh, international studies and plant science, hmm. and then ended up uh, going to get a master's degree, a master's in science in interpretation, uh, natural resource interpretation. And uh, the, bud the budget, state budget was so bad that my advising professor said, you know, go away and come back later. And so... I got a job as a supervisor in the California Conservation Corps and absolutely loved it and stayed there for 17 years um, and did lead crews of 18 to 25 year olds, mostly from urban areas. And I would take them out in the woods for eight days at a time. So we'd camp at these remote project sites. Oh, wow. Cool. And we do we do salmon habitat restoration or prairie restoration or tree planting or firefighting or trail construction. And it was just amazing. And I just left it um, a year ago to get my dream job, which is one I went to college for. Um, I love the CCC too. The CCC was a dream job, but definitely after doing that for 17, 18, I think maybe it was 18, 19 years, actually. Um, you know, I needed a break. I was tired of sleeping on the ground. I was tired of like, <laughs> you know, backpacking all the time. Like everybody, I, I stopped backpacking and camping for fun because I did it for work. <laughs> yeah. And, um, huh. you know, it's just, I, I've been outside more than anyone I know. And so it was just time for me to stay home and have a cat. And, um, cool. So I got this job as a nature guide for the California state parks and um, it's been interesting. So like, let me back up. You know, I'm d doing quite a bit of yammering here, but when I was working for the CCC, the core members started wanting me to get into social media so that the pictures I took from my boss in the, in the department, I could start making available to them. So they created a YouTube and a Facebook and a MySpace for me. And the third video I ever uploaded with us uh, went viral, went super viral. And it was, cool. um, me in 2013 it's called boss dances like a boss <laughs> and it's we were at a remote facility and we were cleaning up and i danced and we uploaded it and um and i was i wanted to delete it because i was embarrassed about it <laughs> and but you know but everybody they were all like i'll oh, leave it up so our moms can see it because everybody's always trying to hook me up with their mom you know <laughs> so um funny <laughs> i left it up there and pa bam it went viral and at the same time, I had just gotten a gig with the EPA to work on a community education guidelines, um, community, community environmental education guidelines. And so I already, so I had this really cool connection with a really awesome group of people, Kima Price and some others. And so when the, an outdoor Afro roadmap from outdoor Afro, so that when this uh, viral, when this video went viral and I didn't know what to do, I had uh, those people to advise me and they said, this is your time to talk about your mission in life, which is to connect people with nature and wildlife conservation. And so I did. And that ended up leading to a 10 episode online show with animal planet called wild jobs. Cool. Wow. And, um, 
and creating a dance called the, because now I'm the dancing guy. So then I created a dance for National Geographic called the Bile Blitz Dance, and that went um, <laughs> international. And wow. Bile Blitz dances started coming in. Other people's from like Romania and Africa and uh, Siberia and all these places. And so it's just been an adventure ever since that happened. And um, yeah, so my platform grew. And so here I am making Facebook lives for state parks, and some of those are going viral too. Um, <clears throat> Because I've because I've tried to keep it as relevant as possible. Cool. So there's that. So one day you're embarrassing yourself doing a dance, and the next day you're on Animal Planet. <laughs> yeah. So the lesson is don't ever be so insecure that you sabotage yourself. You know, it's like <laughs> don't take yourself too seriously. Yeah. Because I I almost I almost deleted that. They they talked me out of it, and so uh, hmm. what a wow. huge missed opportunity it would have been if I would let my insecurity rule the day. True. Yeah wild how that works mm -hmm. so what'd you do for animal planet what are the some of the things that you uh some of the shows some of the things <clears throat> well it was based on the dirty jobs model and it was a just a 10 episode project um that i'm hoping to do again as soon as i retire but um we would go out where people were doing jobs with animals uh wild animals mostly and i would work with them for a day so a lot of wildlife care centers uh, sanctuaries, um, herpetological society, stuff like that. So it was super fun, like such a blast. Dream come true. Cool. <clears throat> so what would you do with some of the animals? Uh, I <clears throat> hung out with the alligator <clears throat> named Mr. Stubbs, who was getting the first reptilian prosthetic tail. Hmm. And, and then I worked with another alligator named pumpkin who <laughs> was raised in a little tiny cage in water her whole life. So she had like deformed bones and stuff. Hmm, wow, so I helped things. with her therapy. Yeah. I, uh, fed a lot of injured and recovering animals. I released some, hmm. um, hawks, peregrine falcons and, uh, red tail hawks and gulls and squirrels back into the wild that had been rehabbed. Cool. Uh, I got to, have a pretty amazing monkey experience where I had monkeys cr crawling all over me. <laughs> um, yeah, got to pet a skunk for a long time. Oh, just so much cool stuff. Got to hold a um, Asian monitor lizard, huge, very heavy monitor lizard. All kinds of just like I had a baboon give me a kiss, uh, <laughs> which was the most terrifying experience in my life. Um, yeah, there's there was a lot of really cool, a lot of really cool. Um, experiences in that. And I really hope to get to do it again. Cool. Nice. Interesting. Cool being around all the kind of different animals like that. Oh, yeah. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so, when you were young, you were mainly in the city. Is it, were there any experiences that got yes. you into nature or was it like on your own or what? Well, you know, I fell in love with nature in the middle of a very urban, very paved mobile home park. And it was where my grandmother lived. And we, we all lived pretty urban. And But she lived in this very paved mobile home park that was like right downtown. I don't know how it existed there for so long, but it's now, it's now other business properties. But, um, and it was very white trashy. And, and she had this little tiny backyard that she had converted uh, very took out most of the lawn my grandma was so ahead of her time like she was a she was an environmentalist before the term had been coined and um she she was just a, she was homeless during the depression so she never so she fixed everything like you know they they hunted for their food they would leave the city and go hunting and fishing um they composted everything she had worm bins and she had this backyard that was full of fruits and vegetables and also a lot of plants. And she had this rule that whenever a bird planted a plant that she would just, it was meant to be there, which was a great rule. And so she ended up having a handful of native plants in her yard always, but her backyard was an oasis in the middle of this mobile home park. It was, you know, there was butterflies and bees and hummingbirds. And I remember as a very young child, like where I'm holding her hand as we walked down the stairs of our mobile home park uh, porch into her backyard and i remember 
noticing that grandma's backyard was different from every place in the whole world hmm. because there was so much life there. Cool. And I remember one time in particular, she, she says, um, did I ever tell you I could call toads? <laughs> I was like, no, no, but it doesn't surprise me because you're a magical grandma, you know, so I'm thinking. And so she does this weird ribbit, ribbit <laughs> sound. And then she's like, go look under that pot. And I go and I turn over this pot and there's a toad in there. And it, I pick it up and it pees on me. And she's like, you <laughs> might get warts and you might not. You have to keep watching. And I got terrible warts, but we know that's not from the toad peeing. It was like total coincidence. Yeah. But that made me get, that made me think that toad pee created warts. And, and she told me it wasn't true, but I just never believed her after that because I had these warts. It was funny. But anyways, huh. the, cool. um, the experience of seeing a toad in the middle of the city I knew when I was a kid that that was unusual. I don't know how I knew when I was so young, but I knew that grandma's yard was special. And I looked for those things and I tried to recreate that. So like a lot of my first experiences in nature were me trying to attract it to my backyard. And that's why I'm so thrilled with kind of the movement that Doug Ptolemy has started with like homegrown national parks and people like planting native plants in their yard. It's so exciting for me because that's where it started for me was trying to attract i put a little pond in my backyard i got like a paper boy job and because my parents wouldn't pay for it now we had this tiny little backyard in the city and i got a paper boy job and saved up for cement and dug a little pond and made a pond and cool went to the uh the creeks that still existed you know in the city and caught you know all the animals out of there and put them in my pond and watched things fight it out and learned about ecology that way hmm. interesting wow what kind of stuff do you remember seeing and learning and what kind of animals did you get in there well, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area where we have, in the Bay Area, we have access to a lot of greenways. Um, so even though you're in the city, you can get to wetlands really fast. Cool. And so, and this is, this is back in the 70s and 80s. So I could ride my bike, you know, 20 miles from my house. It wasn't a big deal <laughs> back yeah. then. Yeah. So uh, I would come back with a backpack full of turtles or, you know, trying to ride my bike holding a, bu a bucket of water with stickleback <laughs> and you know, mosquito fish and, or mm. alligator lizards and snakes. And I would l release all these things into my backyard, my urban backyard. And so you never knew what you're going to come across in my backyard. And, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. So everything just kind of ended up in this pond. And that included like, I'd go fishing with my grandpa and we'd bring back flounders and mm. um, wow. I'd put those in my, my pond and they'd live for a few weeks because flounders are just tough like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a catfish that you could feed out of your hand and, it was just, you know, I had tons of box turtles because I was also, I'd go over people's houses and if they had a turtle and they weren't taking good care of it, I would steal it. <laughs> I was a little, I was a little like criminal animal rescuer. And oh, so, um, and no one was taking care of their turtles as well as I thought they should. So like if you had a turtle, it was probably going to get stolen. Eventually. <laughs> and uh, so I had this crazy backyard and that's kind of where I, I started learning about animals and Ecology. And I feel so bad for all those animals. Like none of them made it out alive, you know, hmm, but yeah. it's funny because I talk to other lifelong wildlife conservationists and ecologists and they have very similar stories where like many animals sacrifice, you know, unwillingly and, and, and ignorant sacrifice their lives for my uh, education. Hmm. Yeah, I've heard that a lot so, and stuff I've read too about mm -hmm. the beginnings of great naturalists and people who are well known and a lot of biologists and all this. Starts out kind of similar. Yeah, starts off with a bunch of poor animals getting experimented on. You know, like I loved them and I tried to take good care of them. I just didn't know what I was doing and I didn't have yeah. any mentors. So yeah, yeah it'd be very different error. nowadays with um, the mentor that's available worldwide, Doctor Google. You could ask yeah. Doctor Google. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure Google has saved many wildlife's lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's cool. It's interesting. Um, but um, anything else from your background you want to share about your degree or any interesting stories growing up or in college? Or well, we can loop back to we can loop cool. back to them. I got I got I'm a storyteller, so I got zillions of stories. I can I could fill a year's worth of podcasts of stories. Don't get me started. Cool, cool. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll loop back at the end. <laughs> Sweet. So, um, what do you do now? And what do you like about your job now? <clears throat> so my day job is working for California State Parks. And I am the Ill River Sector 
natural and cultural resource interpreter. So I have many parks in my territory and I'm the only full-time interpreter here. And so um, including Stinky on Wilderness, which is probably one of the most, like arguably one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Like seriously, not just saying that because hmm. I have some kind of hometown pride, but. What do you like about it's, it? It's, like why? Uh, it's, it's very, very rugged. It's sea bluffs. It's little tiny coves with uh, very high biodiverse tidepools. Hmm. Um, redwoods to the prairie, redwoods to the Doug Firs, to the prairies, elk everywhere, hmm. um, beautiful twisting creeks, awesome rock outcroppings, um, beautiful rolling prairies, meeting going into old growth redwoods. It's pretty incredible. What's the name of it? Um, Sinkion Wilderness, and I would recommend, it's a state wilderness, I'd recommend everybody go visit. How do you spell it? And then I also, uh, S-I-N-K-Y-O-N-E, it's the people who lived here for thousands and thousands of years. Okay. Um, there's, yeah, their culture is pretty much gone now. There's some people who are still Sinkion descendants, but um, they were treated horribly, like many other tribes in California, That's genocide and... Yeah, horrible. But can you spell um, it again? I I put it down and then spell correct changed it to sinkhole. So it's like oh, <laughs> I didn't catch that. Can you spell it again? Sorry. S i n k y o n e. It's like sinky one. Okay, there, got it finally. Thank you. And um, and then Humboldt Redwood State Parks, and then and then Richardson Grove State Park, and Grizzly Creek Redwood State Park. So the rest of my parks are mostly redwoods. Um, in fact, the biggest contiguous redwood forest in the planet is um, in my in my territory. Hmm. So um, I, I'm i probably one of the luckiest interpreters on the planet because the places that I have to interpret are incredible and very, very easy to interpret. Very, It's very easy to be a nature guide there because people come here and they're in awe because you're you know, you're in the hugest trees. Just to give you an idea for your listeners where I'm at. Do you remember the speeder chase scene in Empire Strikes Back, you know, before they got to the Ewok village? Um, some of that's so long ago. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Maybe folks out there do. A, but I don't, I don't know. There's a speeder chase scene where, the, you know, the, the bad guys, the stormtroopers are like crashing into these giant trees and stuff. <laughs> and that is in, in my park. That's literally like a mile and a half from my house. Huh. So yeah. um, cool. it's, you know, think Ewok village and that's where I live. <laughs> and, um, it's, it's incredible. It's very beautiful. It's very easy to be a nature guide there. Uh, because of COVID it's kind of changed this job up for me. So I started the job and two months into it, COVID hits. And so it's been almost vir all virtual, but, um, you know, I started a Humboldt Redwood State Park page uh, 10 months ago Cool. and it's got, you know, 10,000 likes and 13, 14,000 followers. And, I've um, attracted the attention of quite a few people because I've been able to do these videos showing the beauty of the, and just the, the awe inspiring landscapes that exist in these parks that really resonate with people. Yeah. Modern technology used right rocks. Yeah. And so how long has there, like I've heard of nature guides, but nature interpreter, when did that, terminology come about uh probably the 60s but it's like pretty insular like it's um it's something we call it ourselves i really don't like it because people always think it's you know language interpreter mm -hmm. uh i wish we just called ourselves nature guides or cultural and natural resource guides but it's basically like when you when you go to a park and you get a nature talk by a ranger that's me mm-hmm and so that's, that's essentially what it is. Nature interpreter and nature guide are basically the same thing, or is there any like yeah essential difference? No, they're they're the same thing. I mean, I talk about more than just nature. I also talk quite a bit about history and mm -hmm. cultural history, uh, which there's pretty phenomenal history and cultural history in my uh, sector as well. Cool. Um, what's the difference between like a nature guide and a naturalist? Um, a nature guide is a naturalist who engages people on an educational level. Okay. So it's, you know, a naturalist could just be someone who is, you know, checking out nature and like, you know, doing citizen science or whatever.
but a nature guide is more like an educational role, I guess you could say. That's my own definition. Okay. Cool. And what kind of history you got in your area? Well, we have some pretty horrible indigenous, uh, you know, uh, colonizer. Unfortunately, yeah, all over. Yeah. Yeah, ter terrible here, like among like, the man, worst. Just imagine if some of them Native Americans were still around. The stuff you could learn, like in my area, I freaking wish to be able to talk to people who know continuously and have maintained like the wisdom of like what this area used to be like and the animals and the plants and the ecology. That would be, that's like, that would be so freaking awesome i can't even put it into words how much i'd like that well we're, well check check this out this was one of the most um this mm -hmm. this was the highest density hunter gatherer huh. uh per, per square mile in the entire planet this area right here hmm. wow um a lot of these a lot of these native americans didn't have words for starvation in their language mm. um okay. and they didn't they didn't have they didn't have history of war either. There are so many different tribes here. So where I live was the Thinkion tribe, and they're all but gone because they were massacred really early on. But the Yurok tribe, so right now where I'm sitting in Arcata, um, this was the uh, boundary of the Wiat and the Yurok tribe, both of which are still here. Hmm. And cool. um, in California State Parks, there's seven guides, and three of us are Yurok uh, descendants. Oh, you are? And wow, so, cool. Yeah, and hmm. so they... Um, I'm not, but three oh. three of our team okay, is seven okay, okay. Yeah, So yeah. they're um you know they're full blooded Yurok and um they are still uh, practicing the culture. They they speak the language, um and they do teach us stuff all the time um, about what this area used to be like. And they serve as um, everything from fires to restoration. Um, they're very involved with Yurok culture is still here. Um, the Wiat culture is still here, um, although they were impacted far more by colonists than the Yurok. But so we do have that in Northern California. We, you know, the Yurok tribe were only um, contacted 150 years ago, hmm. and a lot of them were able to hide out in remote areas. And so huh. they um, ah. still have their spirituality, still have their everything. They still practice all their stuff. Interesting. And cool. so um, we, we learn a lot from them. What are some of the things you remember that, like, scientists didn't know or people that they taught you well there's a bunch of stuff i mean we didn't know like uh the colonial science we'll call it western science we didn't know what lived here like what you were saying and so the yurok people have been able to tell us what lived here and so we're reintroducing california condors to this area um primarily with the advice and the hand-holding from the Yurok tribe huh. um Interesting. we we also we, we're also doing a lot of salmon habitat restoration um, with the advice and the handholding of the Yurok um, tribe, uh, fires, they, they are, uh, they've been teaching us about fires, thank goodness. Um, and we're going to bring back their ways, um, mm. to help us manage. Cause, uh, they, they manage California with fire. They don't call it management. They call it having a relationship with, in fact, mm. one of my good friends who's Yurok just told me that, um, they saw lightning strikes as God's, the creator's footprints. And so wherever lightning struck, they would burn that area over and over and over again and create a meadow there or a prairie there. And that's how oh. a lot of the prairies and meadows got here is because whenever the lightning struck, they thought the, the creator wanted fire there. So um, hmm. this was a very biodiverse, beautiful place until colonizers came here and stopped the fires. And we're learning the hard way and the Yurok are helping us now. So um, we're listening to them now, I should say. So how long was fire out of the area and when did it become reintroduced as a tool? Uh, right after contact. In fact, there's <clears throat> in the 1900s, there's papers from the um, Forest Service, Stevens Forest Service supervisors saying, if you see any Native Americans setting fires, um, shoot them. <laughs> so it's wow. probably been, uh, wow. yeah, <laughs> it's, it's been about a hundred years, I think, since fire has been out of taken out. And so the fuel loads have gotten really big. So this year, you know, there was like 4 million acres or something in California that burned and everybody's like, it's, there's more than that. That's more than ever. No, it's not. That's how, that's 4 million acres is, is how, how much the indigenous people burned in California. Hmm. The difference between the difference between this year's 4 million acres and 150 years ago's 4 million acres is the severity. So the severity this, this year was intense and burnt things to the ground and killed things. Whereas 150 years ago, 
the fires were all very small because they did them so frequently. And so they were just like brush clearing, healthy fires. And um, when you look at old pictures of California, you could see that the trees were spaced very, very far apart. Whereas now it's a dog hair thicket. You can't walk through it. Hmm. But 150 years ago, you could ride side by side with, a, a, you know, with another person on a horse. Hmm. So um, we have a lot to learn. And the Yurok people are being very helpful. And oh. I feel like um, we're going to get a handle on things. It's as so long as we continue this cooperation. And a lot of us are scared of fires. I mean, clearly fire is damaging. But um, so folks know a little bit, um, when the brush isn't cleared out, then the fire, as you say, is more intense, lasts longer. Whereas when it's fires are kind of more regular, then it burns through. Temperature doesn't get as hot. It's a lot quicker. The fire will just run through. Less smoke. Yeah. Um, Way less smoke, yeah. So what else would you, like, tell the folks so they know the difference between not burning an area for a long time and having these fires that go through regular? How else would you describe the difference? Well, you know, in, in California, our, this is a fire-adapted environment. Um, we have pyrophilic plants um, that, like, serotonous cones on our cypresses and our lodge pole pines and our... Um, knob cone pines, where those won't, the cones don't even open and let out their seeds unless they catch on fire. We have a lot of plants we call fire followers and pyrophytic, py, pyrophytic plants. So they, they're, fi, they're basically pyrophytic means fire plant. And we have a lot of these that have been in California forever. So the um, fires have been here since before humans got here. And then when humans got here like 20,000 years ago or more, uh, they saw that the fire was maintaining the ice age environment. So like grasslands with um, a diversity of different berry and um, potentially medicinal using medicinal plants. And then they saw that with the lack of fire, as the climate started changing from ice age environment to what we have now, um, that the conifers like Doug firs would encroach on these prairies. And then you'd have less, you know, back then they had Pleistocene megafauna. So you'd have le less ground sloths and less camelops and less quagga and less elk and antelope. And so, they knew that they needed to keep the ice age environment, although that's not the language they would use, of course. Um, so they set fires to maintain these prairies, maintain these, you know. So California has, you know, never been a wilderness. It's never been untrammeled and untouched by man. California, since the last ice age, has been managed by humans um, consistently. So, and, and we have done that with fire as an indigenous people. And um, and then today, and then we stopped it when the colonizers came here, and we need to go back to that because that's what California evolved for, is to fires. And you know where where I'm at, I live right outside the redwoods in this oak woodland, and it's being invaded by Doug firs. And in another 50 years, those Doug firs are going to shade out the oaks, and we're going to lose tons of wildlife because oaks support like over 400 species of insects, you know, which is bird food mm -hmm. and, um, and butterflies and, mm -hmm. and other pollinators. And also they support um, tons of animals just because of their structure and their acorns and Doug firs support far, far less. And so all over California, you have Doug fir, you know, stands replacing oak woodlands, which is a tragedy for wildlife and um, fires can correct that. Cool. Yeah, because so, go ahead. Oaks, oaks survive fires way better than Doug Furs. Cool. So fire is an essential, critical part of some ecosystems. Take away the fire and you change everything, the flora and fauna. Oh yeah, greatly reduce the biodiversity, greatly reduce it. So some people might move to an area and think it's beautiful and they want to get rid of fire, but then if they do, then the thing they think is beautiful is no longer going to be there. Yeah. And I've seen oak woodlands, like, I've seen, you know, you, you can go into these Doug fir stands and see all these giant oak tree skeletons, you know. <clears throat> and you can tell that this was once a gra grassland with huge oak trees and probably was so biodiverse. And now it's, like, basically this dog hair thicket of Doug firs. So there's, they grow so close. There's, there's The bottom's totally shaded. There's nothing growing on the ground. Hmm. You don't hear anything. There's no birds, you know, it's just like this desert. It might as well be, it might as well be just like a plastic desert. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Then I've read some things that say when some early Europeans came over, um, don't remember what part of the country it was, 
it was, but uh, <clears throat> they said that the forest that land looked like what they would describe as an English garden. Um, yeah, a park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very well, very managed, but wild. And there was just like yeah. trees and nut trees everywhere. Just a, so much food. Yeah. It was the type of agriculture they didn't understand. Like, hmm. um, Unfortunately. Still, yeah. yeah. Still, I think that like anthropologists, culture anthropologists, well, maybe they're updated themselves now. I haven't really been keeping my finger in the pulse of that field, but they, uh, what happened here was not totally hunter and gatherer. Like you can't call these people, these indigenous groups, you can't call them hunters and gatherers because they most definitely had a form of agriculture. It was just an, mm -hmm. a very ecological based agriculture. <laughs> they used fire differently. They used different amounts of fire heating fire they pruned they managed bulb fields um they knew how many deer existed in their territory how many elk existed in their territory how many grizzly bears existed in their territory cool how many wolves existed in their territory like they knew these things and they and they burnt in ways it's like i could go off on this but i'll just if readers are interested in the subject they should get the book before the wilderness by cat anderson before the wilderness by cat anderson it will change the way you view, view the outdoors. It's one of the only books I've read twice because I don't hmm. usually read books twice. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's uh, I don't watch movies twice, anything like that. But this is a book I've read twice because it's uh, the first-hand account of a literate person coming into California. So like a Spanish or a French or a Russian, because um, this was actually Russian territory a long time ago. Most people don't know that. Hmm. But um, their their account of what they saw the native Amer americans doing or, or or their accounts of the landscape and then it'll be that and then it'll be followed by an essay from a native american or and or an ecologist explaining what the um european was observing so it's such a fascinating book hmm. yeah sounds that's cool i'll have to get it is it on audible too or just a book i don't oh. think i don't know i'll look it it's up audible Bef I'll look yeah it before up. the before the wilderness by cat anderson and thomas e blackburn cool but yeah um let me put it Yeah, I think since a lot of people regard farming and agriculture as being so chemical and physical and machine based, just this ecological idea is like not even on their radar, not even in their context. I know I see that too with like fitness. Um, I'm trained in functional fitness and mm -hmm. um, do a lot of stuff outdoors and a lot of people do not get it at all. It's like if you're going to, you know, because the idea is like in our culture, if it's going to be fitness, it's going to be in the gym. Oh, you go to the gym. That's where you work out. And if it's not in the gym, it's not a workout. Um, mm -hmm. Missing the total, the broader context of human evolution and development and what real fitness is. Um, mm -hmm. And not real, you know, they don't realize that this thing in gyms is just a fad that came about from like the 70s. Um, it's not the way or the best way we've become fit through our history um yeah just a lot of things like that kind of similar mistaken thinking agriculture is chemistry it can be ecological i never thought of that it's like people can't wrap their heads around it a lot of times yeah yeah it's like the whole another another analogy or example of that is um like how there's vegetables and then there's organic vegetables <laughs> yeah it's like it was like organic is, is like or, organic should be the base so it should be like vegetables and then chemically enhanced vegetables or chemically <laughs> true yeah it's, yeah you know you know yeah. what i'm saying like yeah it's, it's like it's weird it's backwards be... yeah backwards yeah mm -hmm. or yeah i get that too with like shoes should be the same um i know shoes are important we need them but Nowadays, because of the fads and social conventions, people think shoes are the norm um, mm -hmm. without having that broader biological, ecological perspective of what a human really is. Um, yeah. Their thinking is more social based and more short term in history. And so yeah. when I'm out in the woods barefoot, you know, I get some people, they don't want to face the fact they're so into their fad and their convention, and their small thinking. They see me barefoot. You're crazy. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. like, it's like, yeah, who's crazy? 
Um. Yeah. No, we're 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 animals. I know. I I True. I often I started referring to myself as a fire ape sometimes. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah. You know, because I'm you know like I'll do something and I'll and I'll get mad at myself like oh I overreacted or whatever and I'll go forgive yourself you're a fire ape. You know, you evolved for you evolved with Pleistocene megafauna and Pleistocene predators. And so we have like a, we have a overreactive alert system and we didn't evolve mm-hmm. for, you know, sitting in front of, you know, screens all day long and, um, and behaving ourselves to the degree that we do. And yeah. so we, we evolved for, we evolved in little clans and we were fire apes and this is a whole new world. And, and we're like, you know, we're only the third or fourth or fifth generation really doing this. And and as far as this level of psych you know, of uh, technology, we're the first. And so we're going to make tons of mistakes. And I have a feeling that's why a lot of us are on uh, drugs, uh, either prescription mm-hmm. or recreational, is because uh, this is not what this is not the habitat we evolved for. So we are we are like in the wrong habitat, and um, this is like a created habitat based on. Uh, greed and luxury and trying to like conquer nature and uh kind of i feel like we've we didn't bring the things that worked from our fire ape days we didn't bring those things with us as as much as we should have and maybe maybe that's what's going to happen in the next hundred years hopefully is that we're going to bring bring back i mean the evolutionary psychology has taken off and i think that that's going to be really helpful in helping us understand why why we why we are the way we are yeah it's interesting because some people I know that are otherwise very reasonable, they don't really know biology or ecology. They're just kind of airy fairy kind of sorta. And oh, we adapt. Oh, so we adapt to things. But no, we don't adapt to anything. We have in nature, and a lot of stuff that's happening nowadays is we're maladapted to it, and that's why a lot of Americans are so sick and diseased, and have all these problems. Yeah. Like you're saying, we got to be use the technology to be true to our nature. And yeah, um, do things that not try to adapt ourselves to the environment, however it may be. Oh, we got to be inside. Oh, we got to sit in a chair. No, we need to totally reevaluate it at a basic philosophic level and think: How do we adapt the world to our nature, or how do we make a world that's proper to our ecology and nature and live in that, so we can be survive and thrive? Mm-hmm. Instead of yeah. Hamming ourselves. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I wish I could live to be two or three hundred years old because I want to see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I feel like there's some segments of the population that are starting to wake up to that, yeah, and some, some who are drifting, drifting even farther into the abyss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah, I see the same thing. Interesting. But um. So yeah, fire. And then aren't some pine trees, the way they, besides their pine cones, the way they grow, the branches are up really high so they cannot be burnt by the fire. So they're adapted specifically to that. Yeah, they're like ponderosa pines and I think Jeffrey pines, they do uh, Mm self-pruning. And so they'll actually, you know, kill off their bottom branches and, um, and drop them. And that helps what what firefighters call ladder fuel it helps eliminate the ladder fuel so like so the like fire can't climb up into the Mm. tree's crown to the green part and so that's another fire adaption that's another pyrophytic pyrophytic plant adaption and um and then redwoods are incredibly fire resilient um they have you know on a big tree you can get a foot thick bark that has very little resin or sap in it which is unusual (laughs) and so uh they just don't burn like it takes an extremely hot fire crazy fire to kill an old growth redwood forest um it just i i don't know anywhere where it's happened and um Hmm. so they're very very i mean they can even get hollowed out completely hollowed out by fire you know by consecutive fire several fires and still survive Hmm. still grow so um Hmm. They're incredibly fire adapted. And then also redwoods and some other conifers in California can stump sprout, which is unusual. Not very many. There's there's like three that I could think of right now. Yews, uh, the Pacific yew, and the nutmeg, and um, redwoods. And so they can they can burn and then, and then re-sprout and regrow. So um, that's a pretty incredible fire adaption too. And then we have other plants here that submit oils that encourage fires because they want to burn. 
hmm. because it eliminates their competition. So like hmm. creosote or chemise, excuse me. Hmm. Um, so we have a lot of different kinds of fire adapted plants here and a lot of plants that um, their seeds will sit dormant for, you know, 80 to 150 years waiting for a fire to clear out everything else they could grow again hmm. and make seed and then drop their seed and then have their seed, you know, lie dormant in the seed bed in the soil. So um, this is just a fire adapted place. California is always going to catch on fire. And so we have to learn how to, uh, we have to learn how to adapt to it instead of trying to bend it to our will, which we found out does not work. Mm -hmm. um, we need to go with flow. Yeah. Live with nature, not try to live against it. Mm -hmm. It's like people, it needs to be more in the educational system to help people get the principle that human society is in nature. Nature is not in human society. Yeah. Yeah. We it's live a, a with, way of saying it. we live with mama nature's permission. Mama nature doesn't live with our permission. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yep. And that but, is so true. And we learn, and we, we've been learning that the hard way in California for the last three fire seasons. Yeah. Well, some people have been learning. It's a, like experiencing and learning is different. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> what are you learning? But <clears throat> so interesting that yeah, out there, the Indian tribes, the indigenous peoples did not fight much over in my area. Um, I got to look into it more, but there's more of a record of warfare. Like when Cabeza de Vaca was shipwrecked, um, listening to him, it sounds like uh, people would fall asleep. When they would sleep, they would have to keep their weapons with them in case another tribe attacked, which would happen sometimes. And it sounds like... Yeah, they, you know, I... Go ahead, sir. There, there's a really interesting, I think it's the book 1491 is where it talks about this, but um, there was a, we're starting now to collect more evidence. There was a pretty big, there was like a civilization along the Mississippi River that um, ruled that area all the way into Texas, you know, in east and into the Appalachians and, and, and maintained this structure. And mm -hmm. there, that, empire was devastated by european diseases before they even saw a white face yeah and so just through the trade routes um they you know that 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 civilization collapsed and so when europeans went into those areas we were in the indigenous mad max period it was like <laughs> an apocalypse <laughs> and yeah. so like they had lost a great deal of their mentors their children their structure and so they were all kind of in this Mad Max period and because the diseases like preceded the colonizers. And so, um, and that happened all the way to California, even when um, the native people were contacted here, a lot of times they were in their Mad Max period where they were <laughs> recovering from these diseases. And, you know, people back then didn't know what diseases were like we, their, the, the understanding of diseases was completely foreign to how we think of it today. Yeah. So, um, you know, in, in, for, in, in the book 1491, it talks about like how, uh, if you, have you ever wondered, well, let's start here. Have you ever wondered how North, Central, and South America were Christianized so fast? Like it happened literally overnight. And it was because the Native Americans, the Native people here, m many, many, if not most, if not all of them, believed that the diseases were from God. And so they believed that the Europeans God was killing them. And the Europeans believed that as well because mm -hmm. people didn't understand viruses and bacteria. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they thought it was a God thing, but Europeans had been sleeping with their animals in their house during the winter for, you know, maybe thousands of years. Oh, yeah. And so we've already had, we had the bird flus, we had the cow flus, we had the, or the Arak flus. We had the, um, <laughs> the animal flus and the animal, the, the zoonotic diseases. We had the zoonotic diseases in my ancestry. And so those of us who were colonizing were the ones that were selected for um, disease resistance. And so what was a mild cold or whatever to us was a death sentence to the people that we colonized their lands. Mm -hmm. And that's what made it so easy to colonize. And that's what made it so easy to Christianize was that um, the people, the indigenous people, wherever the Europeans went, believed that the God was killing them. Hmm. So they quick, quickly converted to save their lives. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. And, and so in this apocalyptic like stage that the Native Americans were in when the colonizers came, there, were, there, were, there was a new, there was a struggle for power. So they were already like in this, you know, they were already in this power struggle, these different tribes and stuff. 
And so then you introduce Europeans and you have a whole new weird, I mean, it was just like a perfect storm. What happened in, in, in the Americas was a perfect storm of uh, guns, germs, and steel, as Jared Diamond would put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting, but sad. One, that's one reason I like reading the Cabeza de Vaca accounts is because he was here before a lot of that happened. First uh, European contact um, gets to describe some of the Native Americans um, as they were early. It's interesting. But um, yeah, from him and others, sounds like there was a lot more warfare here. Um, Food wasn't as readily available as over there, but uh, yeah, food is not an issue here. So they had, they eat salmon and elk, and what else would be with the acorns? Um, so a acorns were their corn, their rice, hmm, mm -hmm. and so they basically lived inside of their orchards. And um, because oak, their oaks are pretty much everywhere in California, and we have several endemic species that only grow here, and. <clears throat> even just right outside the redwoods, even in the redwoods, we have tan oak. So there was acorns. And so like you could just live off acorns, you know, year round pretty much. Mm. Wow. And during bad acorn years, there was plenty of other uh, things to eat. And then there was ama amazing salmon runs back then. Mm -hmm. And so an elk and deer and rabbits and quail. So they just had tons and tons of food here. And we had, we had over a hundred different languages spoken in California. And when you look at the map of, and don't believe those maps you see on Facebook, like those are so inaccurate. Hmm. The um, here, just in this County, I, I know of 10 tribes that lived in just in this County. And there's probably a lot more. It, it, no, there's, there's a lot more. So um, I, like I said, I'm sitting on the territory of the Wea and the um, Yurok right here. And then, like, in a half an hour drive, I'd get to the Hoopa Territory and the Karuk Territory and the Wailaki Territory and the Sinkion Territory and the Tallulah Territory. So there was so many tribes here. And there's not records, you know, in their oral traditions of warfare. Um, they, they Very small. Like, if someone, if a Weop person killed a Karuk person or a, a Yurok person, uh, they would have to pay. Uh, they'd have to pay for it and they, and, and like, and, and maybe like give a, you know, a, an honor of marriage to someone or something like that. You know, it's like they didn't have big, horrible warfare. Like what we understand happened in other parts of the United States. Hmm. Interesting. But do some people have ideas about why that was, was it, um, cultural the plenty of food in the area or like what? i think it was a combo from what i'm learning from the Yurok people because I, I work closely with them and i, I have for years and i have friends cool. in the Yurok. um they and they're who we know the best because um they're the most vocal and intact and largest tribe in california how many of them are but there? um i'm not sure but they're they're the, they're the, definitely the largest tribe cool. there's you know I, I'm they're all over the place and they're uh, most of them are, in, you know, like integrated to a degree, but a lot of them still practice their language and their tradition. It's just, it's a very fascinating group of people, very awesome group of people. But um, what was the question again? What was the point I was getting to about why they, any ideas about why oh, they might not have fought? Yeah. So they, t one of it was the food prevalence. So, like, everybody had enough food in their territory that it needed to go to someone else's territory, um, especially the coastal tribes. Mm -hmm. And so they just weren't used to defending themselves since they didn't have, like, that war culture. But also, um, like, my friend Skip, who is a um, – he's an interpreter as well. He's Yurok. And he was telling me that, like, um, Yurok people didn't know violence to the degree. And so when – Europeans were attacking them and killing them. Like it was a shock to them hmm. because they didn't uh, murder. Wasn't something that happened here. And that the whole kind of, um, and they didn't have laws and, and like that as colonists know them 
because they had like these cultural things. So he said, one of the cultural things is as a child, when you got up, like your prayer or the first thing you thought of was what good can I do to the community? And so you tried to help and their leadership was picked on based on who was the most helpful. So um, there was this very like, uh, cooperation, cooperation was a huge part of their culture and, uh, helping others. And so like people didn't, people didn't go without in the community, like, because the kids would end up taking care of you or whatever. Hmm. Interesting. What's that sound I hear? Oh, you can hear that. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> that's them damn leaf blowers. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're like there. doing lawn work now. Yeah, so I'm trying to put it when I'm not talking. I'm like putting my microphone in here now. Yeah, lovely sound puts a lot of nice dust in the air, dirt we can inhale, makes a nice it scares away all the birds. Obnoxious sound. Yeah, just got gotta love it. Wish we could have it twenty four seven. How that would help our sleep. Yeah, <laughs> bring some of that nice dirty air indoors. Awesome. But, um, so, pause. I'm a little brain dead. I guess I need more coffee. Um, I'm trying to, like, get my brain to start working, ask questions. <laughs> it's, like, not quite cooperating. <laughs> but, let's see. Um, got some stuff we can talk about there. But, let's see. Um, okay. Kyle, Cougars. Um, what do you know about... How much experience do you have with like cats and bobcat, mountain well, you know, lion, wolf, coyote? The um, you know when that video came out with Kyle, the the mountain lion that was mama mountain lion who was chasing him back and stuff. Um, yeah. you know I saw people demonizing mountain lions again and saying that he that the mountain lion was stalking him and and that was not stalking behavior. And I, you know, decided to use my platform to speak up against that. And I'm glad I did, even though I ruffled a lot of feathers. Yeah, um, I'm glad I did too. Thank to... you, man. Thank you. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, it it needed to be said. And you know, and in the video, I explained how the news works. And I wish that more people understood that. And it was weird how like that was controversial to some people, but it, it's not controversial. It's how the news works. Like we are an ad based society. We are a commercial based society. So like the news is paid for by the commercials during the commercial break. So the, the corporations you see during the, cor the, during the commercial break are paying for the news. And so if you have um, 2 million viewers, you can charge a lot more for the news. Okay. And so everybody makes more money. And so the news is not here to educate and inform as much as they're here to make money. And they're cap it's a capitalistic society. It's, it's just the reality of it, you know? And, um, so they sensationalize things a lot to get people to watch because if you're scared or angry or something like that, you're more likely to try tune in on the news. So um, I wish they'd do both. If they could be wiser and better at their jobs, they could educate and sensationalize at the same time, and it'd be okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah, be edutaining. Yeah. And you know, I think yeah. I think that happens sometimes. But like with cougars, you know, like it appeal it appear, you know, like it's in our, it's in our genes to be afraid of cats. Like that was our, we evolved with cat predators and that's why there's some evolutionary psychologists that think that there's so many fake cat sightings, like all over England, there's all these large cat sightings. There's no large cats there. And so um, a lot of people think it's like genetic memory and stuff like that. But, and it's pretty fascinating. That's all that goes yeah, back to evolutionary yeah. psychology. But um, so when, you know, even though people are dying in cars or dying from a computer falling on them or dying because they got twisted up in the curtains way more often than they are from mountain lions. When it's, when someone dies from a mountain lion, it's like worldwide news. And it's because it appeals to our fire ape. Yeah. The fear inside yeah. of our fire ape. Yeah. I'm glad you brought and, that um, up. Good. Right. That contrast. And yeah. Yeah. And so like, I'm, I'm sick of it. Like let's, let's understand why we have that fear and then be realistic about it. Or cancer. Um, I've, people I've, are people kill, killing themselves with lifestyle and bad diet. Yet, are they scared of that? No. Like, let's all yeah, like exactly. attack and go after mountain lions when we instead of attacking this these bad ideas about diet. How yeah. many people die of cancer versus die of like a mountain lion attack? Or as you say, cars yeah. versus a mountain lion attack. Why aren't they scared of cars? You know, it's like, yeah. yeah. 
And it's because there's this, I, I think it's because there's this like deep, deep fear, fear of cats and being predated, predated upon. I mean, the whole, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the Kyle video thing, but that whole, like, um, you know, beating nature, you know, overcoming nature, uh, subduing nature thing came out of a good place. Um, you know, when you saw your mom or daughter ripped apart by dire wolves, um, you hated them on a level that um, you wanted to see every single one of them die. And that's why a lot of the plasticine megafauna went extinct is because we saw them kill our loved ones and humans don't forget. And so we, you know, and so we poisoned them, we killed them. And that was a good thing back then, you know, on a survival status. And they weren't aware of what was happening globally. So everybody just thought they were killing them in their area. Um, and so that whole like conquering nature thing was a survival prescription. But now that there's 7 billion of us, the conquering nature thing is an extinction prescription. And so we have, uh, but we still have that embedded in us in our culture and I believe in our psyche where we're super afraid of things. And I wanna help us transform out of that because we need predators in our ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's, when we don't have predators in our ecosystem, things get out of whack and we end up having more death and suffering, uh, you know, and, and a loss of ecological functions than when we have uh, apex predators. And we are predators too. If you want to get rid of predators, you got to get rid of us, you know? Yeah, and we are predators too, the ultimate predator by far. So the, I think the video helped. I got a lot of really interesting uh, people reaching out to me, including yourself, um, over that video. Oh, and, sweet. Um, okay, did you hear that, folks? You heard it here. I'm an interesting person. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Mark that on the calendar. If you disagree, it's right there. <laughs> Thank you, Griff. <laughs> I'll pay you You're later. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I encourage people. There's a there's a oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the documentary. It's 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 a documentary about the wolf reintroduction to Yellowstone. It's super short. It's very powerful. I think it's Wolves yeah. and Rivers or Yeah. Uh, yeah. If people just Google uh the Yellowstone Wolf inter introduction, uh or reintroduction. I'll put a link in the is, show notes for everybody. Make it easy. Yeah, it's it's an amazing it's and it's amazing. Uh, short video that helps you understand the impact of apex predators and their removal and their reintroduction. And uh, for folks, elucidation and education, because a lot of people need it more. Um, some already know this, I think, but I'll also put uh, some links to videos and articles about the importance of predators in general, not just the wolves. Um, and then there's something that people see a lot about the Woods of Yellowstone that's shorter. But there's something I found from maybe a PBS thing, a lot longer and more interesting. Um, given some background about how, um, I forgot the guy's name. He was in there studying the Lamar River, why it wasn't functioning as a normal river. And they were wondering what the cause was. Um, fire, global climate change. They ruled that stuff out because of similar rivers and valleys in the area that eventually found out it was the wolves. Um, but that's much more interesting since it's got more context in it. I'll put a link to that too. Um, cool. So, I haven't seen that one. But cool. Yeah, I'll shoot that to you too. Um, cool. But... Um, so what, what are some of the things, some people like your ruffled feathers, like who in particular, kind of in general and why, like at least some of the stuff you're willing to talk about? Yeah. Well, you know what? It's still kind of a, a, a wound. So I, I probably shouldn't call them out or name them, but um, there are some very strong feelings about, predator reintroduction and about the way that the state government happen, uh, handles it in regards to uh, depredation permits and stuff like that. And so it's a kind of an unfolding story right now. And I didn't know any of that when I did the video. <laughs> ah, yeah. Live and and learn. So definitely ruffled, definitely ruffled some feathers. Um, but, you know, I do, I do a lot of education outside of my job. I have my own Facebook page at Griff Wild. Um, 
and my own YouTube channel. And I'm, and I, and I realized, and I do stuff on my own platform, but I realized after this experience that I need to do the majority of it on my own platform and less on, you know, whoever I'm working for as platform, because, uh, there's a lot, uh, when you're, a, when you're, a, when you're a, a managing agency or when you're a government or whatever, you have to try to please everyone, which is an, an impossible task. It's never going to happen, but you have to make show of it. And it's a really challenging thing for state and federal and county and city like managers and politicians, super difficult. And I don't want to be constrained the same way that they are. And I commend them for trying so hard, mm -hmm. but I want to be uh, educated that people can trust and to tell you the truth, whether or not you like to hear it um, based on whatever the most recent sources that I have access to. And uh, I, I, that's the person that I want to be. And so like, I'm looking forward to one day uh, maybe doing another show again where I don't have constraints or just, just doing stuff on my own where I don't have constraints because um, it's hard to make everyone happy. And, you know, I, I think that the, the winning ticket, <laughs> the, the touchdown message that doesn't need to be fumbled is that we all need to be concerned about conservation. And mm -hmm. a lot of us are going to have different approaches and, and we're not going to like each other's approaches, but like we have to, if we're, if we're headed to the same direction, we need to support each other. And one of the good examples of that is like hunting. Um, I have friends who are animal right activist vegans um, who don't even believe in killing invasive species um, like rat, like rats on islands that are killing the native birds. Hmm, wow, and uh, I, I, yeah. And then I have friends on the other extreme who uh, want to shoot everything. I so, know. Um, Sad. you know, and, and it's because I, you know, where I live, you know, like I live in that kind of place, you know, in Humboldt County where you have extremes and, and so I, I've already, have accepted that you're not going to be able to make everybody happy, but you know, there's people who are animal rights activists who want to do rewilding and, and restoration. And uh, there's hunters who are you know, willing to learn how to be conservation hunters. And, and I think that we need to just kind of come together and agree on things. And, and it's really, 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 really difficult to do. I know even there's vegetarians or vegans who have cattle ranches. <laughs> yeah. And, but they want to do it right. They're not doing this CAFO stuff. They want cows raised in a species-appropriate way. They're pastured. They're fed yeah. right. They're taken care of. They have a good life. They have good cow friends and everything, good herd. But um, they don't eat meat, but they still do that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting subject. You know, it's like I, I definitely was – it took range ecology classes in college, and, and I was in the range club in college, too, and – um, it's, it's a, uh, it's a crazy, you know, the, the agriculture is a huge part of the reason why we are having biodiversity losses from agriculture and, um, and still to this day, especially when predators are concerned. So I always tell people, you know, cause people get really, really mad at me sometimes uh, when I talk about wolf reintroductions or anything like that. And I tell them, I was like, you know what, I have faith in humanity. Like, we're still evolving. And if we can take pictures of earth from Mars, we can figure out a way to have cows and wolves on the same landscape. Like yeah. we can do this. Yeah. It's and just going to be a difficult road, but we can get there. I don't, know, I don't know. You know, like education needs to play a part of it. Training people to think in a broader context, more logically, instead of like, Oh, you do this math problem. And now you do this math problem. And math has nothing to do with English or physics. They're all separate. Um, we need that interdisciplinary thinking. Um, yeah. Then, then when you look at it, like, okay, maybe wolves kill some cows, but how and why? How many do they actually kill? And what about compared to the cows getting diseases or this and that? You know, I think there's, or what, what about lightning? Like, don't, I have to look it up, but what? I think maybe lightning kills as many cows or more than like wolves might, some stuff like that. It's like in yeah. the park anyway. I um, well, I'll, have we, to look, I'll have to look that up, but I, I've definitely seen yeah. some lightning, uh, cow, some cow deaths from lightning. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not sure about the actual numbers. I'm just, so, you know, I'm not saying, yeah, you know, I, case. I gotta look it up. But that's just something like a kind of comparison we got to consider that I thought of right now. Disease, you know, like if people are worried about wolves, well, how, how well are you treating your cows so they don't get sick and so they eat right and all this stuff, you know? 
Yeah. It's um, the encouraging thing that I've been noticing in the last 10 years is the younger biologists that are coming out of colleges right now are very interdisciplinary. And I've yeah, been good. working with biologists for years and years and years. I was a biological tech, you know, hmm. in my 20s hmm. and, um, and worked for Wildlife Conservation Society and did all kinds of different, you know, surveys. And I was, and I was just thinking about this recently about some of the biologists I worked for back then. They were brilliant and um, amazing people, but they really thought about kind of like their project in a vacuum. There was, you know, there was some interdisciplinary stuff back then, of course, but like not to the degree that you encounter with young biologists now, they, they're cool. really on it. Good. And um, I, I'm super encouraged by that, super encouraged, because they don't just come out thinking about salmon, or they don't just come out thinking about Swainson talks or spotted owls. They come out thinking about ecosystems and biodiversity and ecological functions. And so um, and they blow my mind. Uh, some of these, you know, some of the recent graduates that I, that I talk to, um, that I meet on the trail or, or that I know and talk to, like, I'm super encouraged. The thing that worries me is that you have this group of, you know, young biologists that are super in the know, but then um, everybody else is so distracted with TV and video games and politics that they're not keeping up. And so when you come out with one of the realized ecological topics, you know, recently realized ecological concepts, um, it's so foreign to, to the non-biologists that they don't believe you. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, especially with the, you know, the, the whole doubting of scientists that's happened in the last, you know, six, seven, eight years, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a tragedy. It's, it's horrible. And, um, and so that's kind of what my job is as an interpreter. I interpret science for the regular person. So like I try to break everything. I, I read scientific studies and I try to break them down into an eighth grade level. And I probably should have told you that at the beginning of the podcast. That's what my <laughs> job really is. Live and learn. Um, yeah. So um, I did that the other day too. Someone asked, um, explain your diet. What do you mean? And because of the way I'm used to thinking and how I'm dealing with it on an everyday level and maybe not having – described it to anybody for a while i start out more abstractly and then i'm thinking as i go and then i finally figure out a way to say it really simply <laughs> yeah 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 I'll, I'll remember that for next time i interpret <laughs> science i interpret science data for the non-scientist cool <clears throat> um so on the cougar thing the mountain lion and kyle um and i was glad the way kyle did it too the way it's presented by the mm -hmm. media at first it's like man, Kyle, is he a jerk? What the hell? But thankfully yeah. you interviewed him. He's making a big deal of it. So Kyle rocks. Thanks, Kyle. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kyle's cool. Yeah. But I like the way he's putting blame on himself for it instead of just blaming someone else for your own problem. I think that's a problem in our culture too. Not enough introspection. Um, looking at. And he's, and he's selling shirts and he's giving the money to Cougar Conservancy and Mount Lion Foundation. Cool. So people can buy his shirts at uh, the Cougar Guy. I think it's the, the Cougar Guy dot com. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And you can buy a shirt and then the money the money is going towards the Mount Lion Foundation and Cougar Conservancy. And with doesn't he have like a Instagram channel or something with the Cougar Guy now? Um, something yeah. like that. Internet. Yeah. Cool. But so, yeah, and I'll put a link to some of that, too. Um, some of these different videos and articles, um, what he did originally, your interview with him, some other things. Um, put it in the show notes so people can look it up. But uh, Cool. So can you tell us about that story and mountain lions and how he handled it and things like that? Well, you know, we when... In the very, very rare case that you are confronted with a mountain lion, um, a, there's a lot of different advice. And I go by based on what the biologists that I know have told me. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and I've only seen a mountain lion up close in real life one time, and it, and it quickly ran away from me. Mm -hmm. I've seen them at a distance and from, from a car, but um, only one time was I in the creek with one, and it ran from me, and it was an amazing moment. But How, um, how close was it? Uh, probably like 50 feet, 40 feet. Hmm, wow. You know, who saw who first? I, when I looked at it, it was already looking at me. So I think it like saw me coming or heard me coming mm -hmm. and I was doing strain surveys. So I was doing, you know, uh, 
it's called habitat typing. So I'm like looking at the, you know, the quality of the, of the Creek for habitat value. And there's a mountain lion in, in the middle of it. So I got to put that in my notes because you have to say everything you see in them like mountain lion. That, I felt, I felt cool that day. And you were alone? Um, yeah, I was alone. Cause back then, you know, in the, in the early nineties, we used to do that alone, but no one, no one does that alone anymore. Hmm. Um, but I got to do it alone back then. I'm really glad too. Cause I had my most magical moments were alone. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, definitely, because you know it's like quieter, and so you get closer to things. But um, like mount, like mountain lions. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the mountain lion wasn't stalking him in the, in that viral video. Uh, I mean, no. She was trying. To, it's called it's escorting behavior, and mountain lions mountain lions are ambush predators. So like, like I said in the video that I did, um, you know. Predators don't have ambulances to call and they don't have hospitals to go to. Mm-hmm. And they instinctively know that if they get injured, they're done. You have to be an Olympic athlete to be a predator. Mm-hmm. Once you are compromised, you are done, you know, unless you're like a, you know, chimpanzee, some kind of primate, but uh, or mm-hmm. wolf maybe, but you know, solitary hunters like mountain lions, they can't afford to be injured. And so they attack from an ambush perspective. They run really fast. They deliver a killing bite. They don't fight things. They don't confront things and be like, all right, deer, let's go. Let's fight, deer. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like they're, they're not doing that. They're coming up from behind. They're pouncing. They're trying to kill fast. Um, you know, they're biting to the neck. And so there's another type of behavior that most people don't know, and it's called escorting. And coyotes do it. Wolves do it. Mountain lions do it. And I wouldn't be surprised if bears do it, although I have no evidence. Hmm. But um, – what they do is when they have babies nearby, they will confront you. And the idea is to get you to back away and head back the direction you came. And that's what she did to him. So she, she was turning to the side, making herself look big. So mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. a mountain lion would never turn to the side and make themselves look big to a prey <laughs> item. Okay. Um, they, uh, she was hissing and false charging, which is something you would never do to a prey item. Like they don't like scare their prey to death. They scare away (laughs) other predators. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, um, and so that, and and so when the, when the stalking thing came out there, I was just like, come on, like, stop it. Like, we don't have to keep people stupid um, to, you know, have them be interested in in this video. This is a very interesting video. This could be interesting from the see what's really happening. Cause this is a rare, that was rare footage. We didn't, yeah. I mean, I don't know if we, if, if that kind of footage even existed before. Huh, wow. And so, um, you know, not to that degree where like, it was obviously a mother and she was false charging and um, she escorted him away and people were like, well, she escorted him really far. Um, that's not really far in mountain lion. That's really far in human, but that's not really far in mountain lion. That's like hmm, true, two minutes, point. one minute, you know, yeah. you know, everybody's like, well, she, she escorted him really far. That ain't really far. She's got great hearing. She's got great nose. She knows what's in her territory. Um, she wasn't how, getting really far away from how big is her territory? Well, with females, it's <clears> to <throat> be you know twenty five to to seventy miles, and males it could be from fifty to two hundred seventy miles. Well, yeah. Miles. So, so, like, what do you think? He was escorted a, escorted for like half a mile, a mile, or no, not even that. Not even, probably huh. an eighth of a mile. Wow, well, yeah, yeah, an eighth of a mile like, compared to two hundred or seventy. It's like yeah, not much. No, no. So she just kind of like escorted him away. And you know, like you could see videos of wolves escorting grizzly bears away. You can, hmm. you know, like in in in, in Golden Gate uh, National Park in San Francisco, um, there's often wolves escorting people and their dogs away. So this is just escorting. Me. I got escorted away. I got escorted away by a coyote in uh, Death Valley when I was solo backpacking. Hmm. I had a um, I I woke up in the morning. This is a cool story. I woke up in the morning. I had I had just got my heart broke, and so. Um, I was in love and got my heart broken. So I was like, I need to go for a long solo backpacking trip in Death Valley. So I went out there and um, I was wrapping it up. It was the last night and I was backpacking out and I, you know, I was only like a mile or two from where I parked my car. And so I was like, oh, I'll just can't sleep here one more night. So I don't have to drive in the middle of the night. So I found this cool canyon and I, and I uh, pitched my tent and I, woke up and I looked out on my, I looked at a screen and I looked out the screen and there was this coyote sniffing around, you know, my, cool. where, you know, right around my tent. Wow. So I was like, Oh, okay, well I'm going to scare the shit out of it now. And I unzipped my tent and it just kept circling, you know, wow. sniffing, snorkeling, 
glancing oh. at me, sniffing, scratching around, just like acting really indifferent. <laughs> uh, wow. cool. Like huh. almost like it came with me. Like, like I brought the coyote, yeah, you know, wow. with my dog. Yeah. And so I thought, well, we'll go away as soon as I strike up, you know, this jet boil and, and make some coffee. Nope. Stuck around <laughs> the whole time, sniffing around, scratching around. Cool. I started talking to it. And, <laughs> um, and so, you know, I was like in my twenties at the time and I was kind of hippy dippy. So I was like, this coyote was sent by, you know, the great spirit and it's here to make me feel better. And so I'll just talk to it. So I started telling it about my broken heart story and that loaded my backpack up and I was like, well, bye coyote. And I started walking and it followed me. And so I hmm. continue to tell all my, my woes and my problems hmm. and, uh, got into my car and really believed that I had this like spiritual wildlife experience. And you know what, if I had to believe that for the rest of my life, that'd have been wonderful. So if you have experiences like that, just go ahead and believe that they were like sent by God or whatever. Go ahead. Perfectly fine. But then later on in college, I learned about escorting behavior and realized that's what was happening. Huh. Uh, the coyote had a den somewhere and was like, okay, human, time for you to go. Hmm. Uh, it's early morning. Yep. Make that coffee. Load up your backpack here. Let me see you to your car. And it walked me almost all the way to back to my car. And, um, and then it turned around and left. Hmm. And I, and it, you know, it was a long time before I found, learned about escorting behavior and, um, and it was still magical just because now I yeah. know the, the Amazing. You know, it was still a magical experience. Yeah. That'd be awesome. But, um, I'll try to find some stuff on that to put it in the show notes for people, but yeah, it's, a, it's an important concept. And that's what I wanted people to know about Kyle's videos. That was escorting behavior. And that, yes, Kyle did everything right. Um, and every time he tried to bend down and pick up a rock is when that mountain lion would charge. And so, of course, he was scared. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I would have done any better or any worse hmm. in yeah. Kyle's position. In that situation. I probably would have done. Until yeah, you're I in it. Until we're in it. We don't know, yeah. Yeah, we don't know. And he and he had and like he had thought they were bobcats. He had filmed bobcats there before. I saw, I saw his video of bobcats. Oh, cool. Um, so he, th he thought those two little mountain lion cubs were bobcats. And he had filmed Bobcats right in that very area, hmm. you know, the previous six months ago or whatever. Hmm. So he thought it was happening again. And then, you know, you see the video. The mountain lion looks like she came out of nowhere. <clears throat> like, she, you know, like she was beamed yeah. from the Enterprise. <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, and so then that happened. And he did everything right. I mean, he got a rock up as soon as he could. And um, when he threw the rock, that ended it. But, um and, you know, people are like, well, he didn't have to videotape it. Well, I'm really glad he did videotape it. <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful that he videotaped the whole thing. It was it was awesome for our collective education. Yeah. Yeah. And please aim for the rear. If you throw a rock, don't aim for its head, please. Yeah. Yeah, aim for its, yeah. It's got kids to feed. That's one thing. If some people kill a coyote or wolf or mountain lion in a situation like that or bobcat, well then you're killing the kids too. And what are the consequences? Yeah, Go ahead. Sorry. Well, you, you're, you're, you're right. And I, I say the same thing with, with outdoor cats, you know, it's like, I love cats. You know, my best friend was a cat, but um, mm -hmm. outdoor cats, they kill birds in the spring. And so that means that there's three or four babies or hmm. five babies back slowly starving in the nest because your cat killed their mom. Hmm. And so if you're not going to keep your cat indoors all the time, at least keep it indoors during the nesting season, please. Hmm. Um, cats are the biggest cause of songbird decline right now, besides, you know, up, up there with habitat loss. And windows. And, uh, windows are a big thing, too. Windows are big, too. Not not as bad as uh, cats, but they're up there. And dogs are a problem with wildlife, too. People are always trying to, trying to demonize cats. Dogs, too, folks. Look it up. Hello. Yeah. Especially right now in uh, the Bay Area, we have a distemper outbreak among the wildlife. And... Hmm. Um, hmm. And most of the time that comes from people's domestic dogs that weren't hmm. uh, vaccinated. Hmm. And it has devastating effects on the fox community. Especially. Wow, damn. But, um, so we got the babies to deal with, but if people were to kill off some of the bobcats and wolves and coyotes and mountain lions, what other, how would that come back to haunt us? People think, oh, you're killing well, a mountain lion. It's not going to attack us, but... What are the ecological consequences? Well, usually what happens is that it increases their prey base. So, like, 
the deer will increase. And, you know, it's funny as I, I teach little kids um, virtual, I take kids on virtual programs and I tell them this, I, I say, I say, you guys solve this riddle for me. How, how is it that mountain lions are good for deer, even though they kill deer? So how are mountain lions good for deer, even though they kill deer? And that's my riddle to them. And the answer to it is that um, it keeps their population in check. And, um, when, and, and, and mountain lions don't go out and get, the, mountain lions don't go stalk a deer and go, oh, that one only has four points on a antler, So I'm going to go for this other one that's got more points on its antlers. You know, like they're not trying to get the best breeding deer. They're trying to get the weakest, the oldest, the youngest, the sickest. They're going for the, you know, the deer that, you know, is probably on its way out anyways, you know, oftentimes, or babies. So um, they're taking the bad genes out of the gene pool. They're taking the sick, they're taking the disease out of the gene pool, you know, mm-hmm. and, and so they're, they're making the gene pool of the deer better. But also when there's too many uh, foragers, they'll, uh, what they'll do is they'll eat all the young trees that are along the, the, this is one of the things. So one of the things they do like that's, that's really pertinent in my area is when we get too many deer and elk, they eat up all the vegetation along the creeks. And so then when the trees, and usually alder trees and cottonwood trees are the ones that grow on our creek banks, and they aren't long-lived. And so they get 80 years old or whatever, and they die. And then because there hasn't been mountain lions for the last 100 years, um, there's nothing to replace those trees because the deer have browsed everything away. So now the creek gets warmer, the water temperature goes over 65, which then kills all the salmon in there. So then you lose all your salmon, which are not only an ecologically important, you know, keystone species, they're also an economically important species in this area. So, um, you know, by killing mountain lions, you're, you're ruining our economy. You can, you can make that connection. You're also killing off orca. You can make that connection because, um, you know, less, less salmon, less orca. We have orca that are starving to death off the West Coast right now because of lack of salmon. So, um, and that's all because the, you know, the, the herbivore pressure was too great. And that's kind of what's covered in that movie about the reintroduction, that short documentary about the reintroduction of wolves. Yeah. yeah is that, say. like, how, how it increased fish. You know, like, in, in ecology, everything's connected. And it's so fascinating to me. Like, I, I am blown. My, my mind is constantly blown um, studying ecology. And I'll yeah. tell you the last thing <laughs> that blew my, yeah. blew my mind. So there's this, we have spotted owls, which are horribly endangered and most likely, sadly to say, are going to go extinct in the next 20 to 30 years, um, <laughs> barring, very extre- barring very extreme events. Um, they're, they're, they're gone. They're, I hate to say it, you know, but like, I, I'll be amazed if they're still uh, spotted owls when I'm 125 years old. <laughs> um, not that I plan on living that long, but <laughs> spotted owls depend on mostly depend on old growth forests and they depend depend on a couple voles and one's called the red back vole and one's called a red tree vole and these voles eat truffles and truffles are like mushrooms but they don't make airborne spores hmm. they make spores and they're like underground so they're like these underground mushrooms that have to be eaten and distributed okay that's how they that's how they get around huh. Huh. so um the redwood tree vole doesn't or the red tree vole doesn't go very far out of its territory but it eats these truffles and then the spotted owl eats the red tree vole and the spores from this truffle survive both the digestive tract of the vole and the spotted owl and so the spotted owl ends up shitting out or or throwing up you know via pellets Hmm. the spore of these truffles all over the forest which then provides the food for their main prey item interesting wow so that's fascinating. You know, it's like, so the spotted owl is basically creating its own habitat. And there's so many examples of that, of like how animals are creating their own habitat, like a bear pooping out berry seeds. Or you can consider it, we can consider it the, the truffle creates its own habitat by using the owl. Awesome. Yes. (laughs) That's even cooler. (laughs) So that's even cooler. The truffle is creating its own habitat. So, um, that's uh, and that's really that's interesting. That's an interesting way to. Put, put, I'm, I'm I'm sorry. I'm thinking about doing this program about what I just told you, and now <laughs> I think I'm gonna um, tell it from the trouble perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! I did it. I actually did something smart for a change. 
<laughs> my one smart thing for the year. Wah! See how the truffle uses the vole and the spotted owl to do its bidding? <laughs> and it, it used me, too. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. So everything's connected to everything, you know, and it's like the more we can make those connections, the cooler it is. And yeah. that's why I love the work of Doug Ptolemy. And, and everybody <laughs> should read Nature's Best Hope by Doug Ptolemy. If I was a billionaire, if I was Jeff Bezos, I would pay everybody to read that book. <laughs> and um, cool. because that book really can make it's called Nature's Best Hope. And that, and it really is nature's best hope. Uh, Doug Ptolemy, his work is every bit as important as Rachel Carson's and John Muir's. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> and I totally stand by that statement. Um, and I will continue to stand by that statement. Doug Ptolemy's work is, is the, you know, he's, he's the EO Wilson. Ah. Uh, 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 he's yeah, he's up there and his work is amazing. And and he talks about how we can create habitat um, and reconnect ecological functions in our very urbanized and suburbanized spaces. Hmm. Nature's best hope. Everybody should read it. If, any, if you care about if you care about wildlife or nature at all, read his book. Cool. Okay. Nature's best hope. I'll put it in the show notes, and I'll look at it too. <laughs> but yeah, it's like the owl thing is a good example, and that comes up with us there's people need to learn us more in our self-interest for each of us and our species to do some things like that the diversity thing because how it all comes around like people oh a snake kill it i get sick mm -hmm. of that and i have to fight that um educate people about the importance of snakes and yeah about coyotes and you get rid of coyotes and snakes and some animals like that then what you're really doing is selecting for rodents in other words you're selecting mm -hmm. for disease and the possibility mm -hmm. of plagues do you want coyotes yeah. and snakes or do you want the black plague that's really the question yeah you know yeah yeah and it's an, it's an important connection and i hope more and more people get it and um and you know it's it, there it, right now there's so many things distracting everybody that it's hard to get the conservation messages out and you know i you know recently a, a tv talk show host reached out to me and because of the mountain video and said you know what's your mission and i said i'm i'm trying to, i'm trying to teach people about ecology i'm trying to teach people about wildlife conservation i'll do whatever i need to do because um i'll be as crazy as i need. i'll dance i'll <laughs> be crazy i'll do whatever i need to do because it's hard to compete with all the entertainment that's going on today, like people aren't uh, going home and reading books and educating themselves um, because, you know, we're humans and we're, we're, we're evolved to save energy. And, and so we'll, we'll pick the lazy way, you know, the path of least resistance nine out of 10 times or whatever. And so it's way easier for people to jump on social media and scroll through and get, you know, you know, a, a consecutive bouts of instant gratification rather than read a book called, you know, the ecology of mushrooms in the redwoods. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, and so like for those of us who care about the earth, like we have to be relevant and we have to be entertaining, um, more now than ever because people aren't going to sit down and listen to anything that's going to make them feel guilty or bad or hopeless. Like, um, Hopeless doesn't sell like the new, you, you notice the news doesn't do hopeless. They do um, anger and you better do something <laughs> now and you better work. You know, they don't do like, Oh, it's too late. But I think I feel like an environmental education and a lot. And, and when we talk about the environment, a lot of people do like, Oh, it's too late. And then people are like, well, then why bother and feel bad? And it's not too late. It's nature is going to win. Um, we're not fighting to save nature. We're fighting to save ourselves. And so, you know, we need as environmental educators, we need to be urgent. We need to be relevant and we need to be um, edutaining. And um, because of, because of what we have to compete with today. And I think that 50 years ago, um, that would have been inappropriate, but I think today it's not only appropriate, it's um, there's no choice. You're, you're the only people who are going to listen to your boring, uh, education about ecology or the choir the people who already know well, some, um, and that's not who we i think there's actually yeah, it's not we need some of the i mean of course to everyone you want some shorter entertaining things and some longer things 
if you want um, like some things to get people's interest or to learn, they need teasers, something entertaining, something short, but there's actually mm -hmm. more of a market for some things. And some people might think like uh, in reading about some stuff for like marketing and businesses, I think um, the articles that get the most attention or that people really dig like look at more actually have more like 2000 words rather than 200 or something. Um, and then like Joe Rogan, you know, his podcast, people were telling him when he was starting, Oh, you got to have it half an hour. No one listens to anything long anymore. You can't go for three hours. You got to go for like 15 minutes or 30 minutes. He's like, no, I don't give a squat. I'm having long, full conversations as human beings do. And look how popular his podcast is. Three yeah. hours. You know? There's definitely, yeah, there's definitely exceptions. And then once you get people curious, like, um, yeah, you know, if you get if you get a blast of, uh, you know, you hear about escorting behavior and you're like, whoa, that's different. Now you're willing to sit down and watch a two hour documentary. Um, yeah, yeah like, so there is there is there is that. Or like little kids, they learn about dinosaurs. <laughs> Look at all the time they spend reading about and watching videos. You know? I still do that with dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's another thing I've always been into is dinosaurs. Yeah, dinosaurs are like so fascinating. Yeah, and it's a great time to be alive because you know we are um, technology and the instruments we have now are really being able to learn some stuff. And another thing I tell all the kids I talk to every week, you know, during these virtual field trips is like, you know, like there are there really are no experts when it comes to ecology. There still are no experts. Hmm. Like there's still some very very common backyard birds that we don't know. Uh, we don't know what they're feeding their babies. We don't know how often they feed their babies. We don't know if the male or female is taking care of them. We don't know if they're monogamous. Oh, yeah. We don't know. We don't know the life histories of some of our most common backyard birds. And we're still discovering species all the time. I just watched this webinar, this guy who studies leaf miner insects, and he discovered five new hmm. leaf miner insects in his front yard in Pennsylvania. Wow. And, um, and he's discovered like over 200 or something like that um, already, but wow. it's like they um, we're still discovering new species of, of big animals. They just discovered new species of gibbons. Hmm. They just discovered two new species of gliders in Australia. Huh. We discovered a new species of flying squirrel in our park three years ago in California. So it's like, we like, there are no experts. We are, we are so far from knowing uh, how our ecosystems function we and, and and we've made it even more precarious and, and and unpredictable by all the invasive species that have that we've introduced. Oh, yeah. So, like uh, ecology is going to be an unfolding investigation mystery adventure forever. Yeah. It's not we're not we're not ever going to know. We're never going to be able to close the box. That's one good thing say, about biology and ecology, as opposed to like. Calculus. I love math. I have a degree in math. I know calculus. But as I always say, no, calculus is not difficult. Calculus is not complex. It's easy. Biology is complex. Calculus doesn't adapt. Your equations never change and adapt and modify. In biology, they change yeah. and adapt and modify. Yeah. Yeah, I just did a, a video about how you could you could study one little tiny, you know, three by three plot for the rest of your life and still not be an expert on it. True. And, um, you just gotta and learn it's the because patience. of phenology. Learn yeah. It. Sorry. it changes over time. A, yeah. a bird can fly over and poop out a seed. Now you got a new plant. That plant could be alleliopathic, meaning that it poisons the soil to hmm. inhibit the growth of other plants. You could have, you know, a fungus that grows in there, changes the soil chemistry. You know, like you can have a fire and, you know, for True. so it's like, you, you, you're never going to know, you're never going to know everything that there is to know. And then people need to do more research on the fragmentation that humans are causing to a lot of environments. Yes. And that's another big, uh, concern and interest of mine is habitat fragmentation. Hmm. And can you tell folks what fragmentation is? What do we mean by that? So it's like uh, it's like you have a just we'll say a ten acre parcel, and it's you have a bunch of 
little box turtles on it or whatever. And then you end up uh, putting your house on one side of it and then a basketball court over here. And then you put a swimming pool over here and then you put uh, a bunch of non-native plants that don't have any bugs on them over here. And so pretty soon you, all you have is like little, you know, eighths of an acre wildlands for your box turtles to live and say like they can't go from one little tiny island of habitat to another one to mate because you got two pit bulls that will kill them if, if they go out into the open and so the, your box turtles you know you have box turtles in those little tiny parts of your yard but over years they inbred and inbred and inbred until they're weak in genetics and they die of diseases and then they're extinct hmm. everywhere even though you had plenty of box turtles within your 10 acres they could have bred and been healthy forever they couldn't reach each other because they were in these fragmented habitats so i kind of look at it as like um animals around here it's like the lava game when you're a little kid and you like jump from your uh, couch to your table because you can't <laughs> touch the carpet because that's hot lava <laughs> so the lava game so like <laughs> fragmented habitat for animals is like they're playing the lava game um because in between the habitat in between the couch and in between the table is uh freeways and agricultural fields and suburbs and you know if you're not a bird and you can't fly from one fragmented habitat to the other um you're screwed you know so mm -hmm. salamanders snakes anything that you know it's got to crawl there ain't gonna make it and that's what we're seeing with our mountain lions in Southern California, especially hmm. yeah, is we sure. have a P20, we have P22, we have a mountain lion stuck in Griffith Park, no relation. Um, <laughs> and it, Griffith Park is a seven mile square, square park. It's much smaller than a, than a male mountain lion <laughs> habitat, but mm -hmm. he's stuck there. He, he like went through Hollywood Hills right past George Clooney's house <laughs> to get to this little park, <laughs> but he's kind of trapped there now <laughs> because if he leaves, he's going to get hit by a car. And he somehow knows this because the other mountain lions, that are on these other fragmented habitats, they keep getting hit hmm, by awesome. cars and dying. Yeah. yeah. So um, it, it's like the lava game. And that's what fragmented habitat has done. I think the most important work right now that we can engage in is to become corridors, to like, to mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. connect these fragmented habitats with corridors. And sometimes the only corridor, corridors that are available are right through our towns. And that's why people should read Nature's Best Hope by Doug Ptolemy, because he tells you how to do that, you know, Sweet. by planting native plants. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and your neighborhood could become a, a migration corridor for monarchs or for many of the other migratory species. Or maybe even, you know, like squirrels could set up fiefdoms, you know, between you and five neighbors' yards. You know, so it's, it, there's things we can do that we're going to have to do if we want to have um, our nature. And one of them is to connect to habitat fragments. So it used to be all nature was interconnected and animals could move around and therefore spread the genes and have genetic diversity. But mm -hmm. the context, ecological context that's happened for millions of years has all of a sudden suddenly changed in some ways, in some places. And so the some of the conditions on which animals need to survive and be healthy and genetically healthy have been destroyed with this fragmentation. Yeah, and thing. it's like, yeah. And it's, and if it's not genes, it's something else, you know, like either they're going to breed themselves out or, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're in a, you know, 10 mile by 10 mile fragment and that whole, and then a wildfire comes through and there hasn't been any prescribed fires, any cultural burnings, so you have a really high fuel load. And so you have this devastating fire, like the snakes and lizards aren't going to survive. Like historically they could have just crawled down, three inches down into a gopher hole and survived hmm. a fire, but now hmm. they can't. And so when you're on this fragmented habitat that is, has high fuel buildup, you're dust. If a fire comes through, you're done. Hmm. Yeah, wow. So, um, you know, it's kind of like how these like mismanagement practices are like meeting each other in this perfect storm of, you know, extirpation and extinction. Mm -hmm. And we got to realize that can happen to us too. I know and, and we, think we're, we think we're all awesome and we got this advanced technology, but technology is nothing if it's not helping us survive in following the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be to yeah. our detriment, just like a lot of Americans are sick, have chronic diseases, depression stuff, and it's because um, the technology needs to be... Um, used and thought of more we need to that's another weird thing where we need interdisciplinary thinking it's great we have all this stuff but okay how does it help us serve human life human biology human ecology 
We need that broader perspective yeah. to play instead of, oh, this is so cool. Hey, I can play a game or whatever. Yeah, and COVID hasn't helped that, has it? You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, um, no, yeah. You know, now people are stuck inside double downing, you know, doing double downing on, uh, and, and on technology. And, you know, I see it in my job, like I'm a nature guide and I do everything virtually now. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's weird. It's, it's Agreed. not as bad. It's not as bad as I, w- I thought it w- would have been. Mm-hmm. Um, cause people are still able to get some awe inspiring experiences, even virtually, but, um, I'm hoping that I'm planting the seeds for curiosity and that people won't want to get outside and explore with their families um, as soon as they can. But yeah. And then I think one lesson we should be learning from COVID government officials, city planners should be learning. It's like, Whoa, snap. It's like, okay, we're stuck indoors where we can't get vitamin D and we're not as healthy. We're moving around more domestic abuse. Whoa, it's because of the way we designed our cities. It's our human built structures and how they're done. We need to change that. If we have wildlife mm-hmm. corridors, hey, we're animals, we're wildlife too. That'll help us. We have a place to get out. Mm-hmm. You could make videos. People could watch them outdoors, do some of the same stuff. If we had more um, wild areas, like, you know, sometimes people are required now. At least some people are learning, oh, you build a subdivision, then you have to build some um, drainage area, some storage for rain. Okay, well, what about um, requiring, like, a little plot of forest on every block or um, a natural, not just a playground park, but a natural park in every subdivision or something, um, or some kind of food forest, a place for a local garden. Um, I think we need to be doing a lot more of that too. Yeah. And the, the designers and planners are there with that kind of stuff. It's just going to take the will of city mm. officials and county officials to make it happen. True. Yeah. Um, same thing with zoos. Some zoos are horrible. They used to be bad, but with some people learning about species appropriate diet, lifestyle, some zoos have totally changed, put it into practice, gotten a lot better. Um, yeah. So, but what can you tell folks about, uh, kind of return to Kyle and the Cougar. Um, If people come across like a mountain lion, what are some of the things they should do? Um, People always say don't maintain eye eye contact. And I say, make sure the mountain lion knows that you can see it Mm -hmm. because that's what they don't want. They, they, they don't want their prey to see them. So if you, if they know that you can see them, you've already, foiled you know 50 percent of their plan that's like a criminal too um, i've heard about that same thing like if you're somewhere you look at someone they know you've id'd them they're going to be less likely to commit a crime against you yeah yeah like yeah make sure make sure the mountain lion knows you can see it and then you want to think about your your house cat whatever makes your house cat play with you is what you don't want to do with the mountain lion Hmm. so don't run uh, no fast movements. Um, make yourself big. If there's more than one of you, one of you get the biggest person, stand out front and make yourself look big and yell. And then the person, the, the smaller person, uh, get behind the big person and drop down as fast as possible and grab a rock hmm. mm-hmm. and, then, and, then, and then throw it at the rear of the mountain lion or even just right in front of it because they trip out on our ability to throw things. Huh. Um, <laughs> And so uh, that'll help. Uh, if you are worried about it, it's always better to overdo it and feel safe than underdo it and spend your time out in nature worrying about stuff. So, like, I always tell people, take bear spray. You'll you'll 99.999999% of the time, you'll never need it. And if you do need it, it will be, be because of someone's dog or a crazy person. It won't be because of a mountain lion. True. But at least you'll feel better, yeah. you know. And so, like, I carry bear spray with me because I live way out in the woods where people dump their dogs. Like, and this is like marijuana producing uh, mecca of the of the planet. And sometimes, very what I consider bad people will tie up dogs just mm. to be bark dogs Damn. at their and then and and then they don't need them anymore and they just let them go. <laughs> and so, like, I I've already I've already encountered uh, two of those dogs in the last six months, <laughs> and um and uh, 
both of them were unfriendly. Hmm. And so I carry pepper spray for that reason. So, you know, the pepper spray works on, on everything else. Everything. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to be pepper sprayed. <laughs> Nothing yeah. wants to be. Pre- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then also an air horn works really <laughs> well. And so you can get a little air horn, loud sounds, but you know, you just, you never want to run. And if the mountain lion is doing what she was doing to Kyle, like false charging and stuff, she wants you to get away. So you can walk away, but you want to walk away facing her. Mm-hmm. And again, if there's two of you, you one of you wants to get rocks, but you definitely want to get out of their territory. Mm-hmm. Um, because a... if they're being if they're being that aggressive, that means they have babies. Cool. Um, or one big thing is just don't go out alone much. Um, go out with someone else have, and make sure you're looking around, not sticking on your cell phone. Learn to observe your environment because that'll help you be a better driver help you avoid criminals. Um, it is, it's good training and mindfulness and consciousness beyond just that situation. And if you're not looking around, you can enjoy nature, look around, observe, identify, um, and be, be out with other people. Um, and, and I also tell people if, if you do get attacked by a mountain lion, you're probably not going to see it coming. mm -hmm. Um, and so it, you'll you'll probably feel it on you the, the last attack we had here um it was a, a man and a woman o- older man and woman like in their 60s and a young and, and what happens is is that when people get a depredation permit they kill a mountain lion that knew its territory and so then its territory gets invaded by a bunch of mountain lions younger mountain lions mm-hmm. And they don't know, they don't understand the territory and they often um, aren't great hunters, especially if they were um, the babies of the mountain lion you killed oh, yeah. and they, they weren't done being raised. Like they're going to go for the easiest prey, which oftentimes is your dog or your cat or your sheep. And so um, if you want to keep the livestock predation down, then don't kill mountain lions because killing mountain lions will actually increase your sure. predation. Mm-hmm. And, and so the mountain lion that attacked this couple was a young mountain lion um there's actually two young mountain lions and you know like where they sh- probably still should have been with their mom so their mom was probably killed hmm. and um and the it jumped on the on the man and then the woman took out a pen and stabbed the mountain lion over and over again until it let go and um and so that's what i tell people if you know if you're if you get attacked by a mountain lion chances are you won't know it until you've been attacked because they're ambush predators yeah um, if they're, if they're letting you see them then they don't really want to attack you, they want you to leave. If they want to, if they want to eat you, you won't see it coming until they're on your back. And in that case, fight, fight, mm-hmm. do not play dead because you will soon really be dead. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you want to fight because mountain lions, like I said earlier, they they need to be Olympic ma- uh, athletes and they're not trying to get injured. And so if they think that they're going to get injured fighting you, they're going to leave you alone. Yeah. And then I like the point you make for wolves, coyotes, bobcats, mountain lions, a lot of predators, a reason they attack is not because of the nature of the thing. It's because of what people have done. So people might kill some wolves, but you're killing some adults who've got the wisdom and who would otherwise train the young to avoid people. The young don't know better. Yeah. They're moving around. And so the ultimate reason it's happening is because of decisions some bad decisions some people are making some things not informed by biology ecology the way things really work the nature of things it's just oh there's something let me kill it um so if you do get attacked by a mountain lion you know like ultimately it's like um you could have some person to blame for it you know it's funny is that people think that ranchers are always the ones that are anti-predators but really a lot of what we know about predator ecology now is coming from ranchers huh cool and so um Oh, here's a Wilson's warbler right in front of me. Oh, wow. Um, so <laughs> the, um, the, so I just watched this interview with, a, uh, on Mountain Lion Foundation's YouTube channel of cool. this, uh, rancher who she's the third generation rancher on her, on her land. And she was talking about how, uh, when you, you know, when her neighbor killed the dominant mountain lion, how they suddenly got attacks. Wow. They started losing livestock because the mountain lion that was there knew its territory and knew not to go around the humans and where the humans were. And so as soon as someone killed them, you know, so she was saying like, 
you could have a big ranch, but it's not going to be as big as the mountain lion's territory. So you can't manage each ranch. You have to manage for the mountain lion's territory. Hmm. And so, um, you know, so everybody who lives in that area has to be on the same page with how we're managing our predators, Mm -hmm. which is a big, huge ask. And what we know that that's what should have been done a long time ago. Like coyotes are the the best story. And like, I'm really starting to love coyotes. The more I learn Mm -hmm. about them. Cool. I just saw one yesterday in my front yard, nice. um, which is not a big, I, I live across the street from the wilderness area. I'm, I don't have any neighbors for five miles. So it's like not unusual for me to see wildlife, but like cool. I was especially thrilled to see a coyote because coyotes are just amazing. And, and they used to be, their range used to be really small. It used to be, you know, in the, in, you know, relative to how it is now it used to be in the West and they were kept out of the rest of the United States by wolves. Kind of like how black bear were kept out of the redwoods by grizzly bears. And so when we got rid of wolves, we created this opportunity for coyotes and coyotes started spreading. And then we tried to employ the same method that worked on exterminating the wolves. We tried that on coyotes, but coyotes have a different biology. Yeah. So um, you, you can't, when you kill the alpha, like even though they're not quote unquote packs like wolves are, Coyotes have this other type of community where the male and dominant male and female are the only ones having puppies in their territory. Other coyotes will live in that territory, but they won't be going into estrus. But once you kill the alpha female, six other females in that territory will suddenly go into estrus. So instead of having one dog having uh, eight puppies a year, you now have six, six dogs having eight puppies a year. So by shooting the mountain lion, you increased the coyote population by several fold. Huh. Now they're not just going after rats and, and rabbits. Now there is um, the carrying capacity of the territory has been challenged. And now they're going to come after your sheep, your baby sheep. <laughs> so you actually, by thinking that you were, uh, that you were like pre-managing your population, you actually were asking for predation. And so now coyotes are coast to coast. They're more numerous than ever, in spite of the fact that we're having coyote killing contests all over the nation and people are killing coyotes and putting on our fences. And when I drive by that, and when I drive by, you know, a, a ranch with coyotes in the fence, I just think, gosh, they, you know, they think that they're warning other coyotes, but really they're just inviting eight times more than they had in the first place. And um, mm-hmm. it's, 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 a, it's another exercise in ignorance. Yeah, it's like very bad unintended consequences. Not some minor thing, but more serious stuff. Yeah. I hear your mountain lion in the background. <laughs> yeah, my mountain lion's hungry. Little panther, he's black. Oh, nice. But, yeah, awesome. I take him on walks. Oh, cool. <laughs> and um, I use a little... Uh, kitty holster thing and a leash um because there are other cats around here i don't want them to get in fights um and then if he gets scared that way we're together although we've had to work on that yeah it's took a little kind of training so to speak experience to learn for him to learn what to do when he gets scared and that it's okay and i'm there and because at first he'd run away and then the when the um thing latch on the end of the leash would when you get to the end of the leash um naturally he'd pivot rotate so instead of head away tail towards he'd be head toward tail away from me and then he's in this thing and of course he backs out um gets out of the kitty holster so we had to work on that but that's pretty much taken care of now. So it's pretty cool. If he gets scared now, usually he'll just, um, flatten and look up at me instead of running away and getting out. Good. But it's interesting too. It's helped, uh, bonding, um, being around together, going on walks like that. Um, I think we're a lot more connected as like a social group of cats now. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, and so one thing I know it's a case is that, uh, um, sometimes <laughs> now that we're 
predators moving around together, sometimes he won't eat unless I'm there. Because <laughs> you know? we eat together. Oh, wow. I mean, that's what cats do. You know, it's like, hey, I'm eating, you're eating, we're together. You know, we're both eating. We're sharing the meal. So I got to go and sit down on the floor near him <laughs> to eat some <laughs> Wow. Or that's cool. he'll, I'll be in the, I'll be there near the food. The food's right there. And he just sits there until I pet him and it'll eat, but he won't eat until I pet him. <laughs> Whoa. So, yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Interesting, too, you know. I mean, I knew before but about cats, but, um, you know, more evidence about what cats are really like, more evidence against this nonsense about cats being all solita- solitary and um, dismissing you and not caring and all this stuff, you know. It's like they're very social, too. But, nice. Yeah, I got two indoor cats. Cool. But um, now for bobcats, would there be anything different people should do? Um, to like kind of train you know, and I've never heard of. Pardon? I've never heard of anybody really having problems with bobcats. Mm-hmm. Even like I, I think that um, uh, there's a bobcat that lives in my friend's farm that's never even attacked their chickens, which is like amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that um, bobcats are really timid and afraid of people. Mm -hmm. They're an animal that I hardly ever see. And I don't even find their tracks a lot. Mm -hmm. And then um, I see, I see wildlife cams from the park where there's bobcats. And I'm like, how are those bobcats here and not leaving tracks? (laughs) And like, how, you know, Huh. They're they're amazing animals. So like bobcats, I don't think will ever be a problem unless one's like in a trap. Um, up until recently, you could trap them in California, hmm. and um, it was getting out of hand because you know the pelt market in China was blowing up, and so people suddenly got a renewed interest in in trapping out bobcats, which hmm. is not good for the ecosystem. Yeah, but that was recently outlawed. Thank goodness, because good. that again. was just ridiculous. That'd be too many rodents and all that stuff in our environment. But yeah, it comes back to haunt us. Hmm. But cool. So they're pretty, and what? Just thirty pounds or so. Um, they go after mice and rats more. They're not going to go after yeah. people. I know some people. That's what I got to. Some questions I got to answer around here. But will a bobcat attack me? Um, no, they weigh 30 pounds. They're not going to come after you. You're way bigger. Um, you know, you weigh like four or five times as much. Would you want to attack someone who's like four or five times your weight? You know, so that'd be like, yeah. if you found someone who was like 500 or 600 pounds, would you want to like mess with them? <laughs> no. Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to Google it, but I can't even, I can't even remember <laughs> hearing about a bobcat attack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the only time might be is if they're rabid. Um, yeah, or or in a, or in a trap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what about um, dealing with coyotes? What should people do if they see a coyote? Um. You know, I've never had a bad experience with coyotes. I had a gr- one time me and my friend's two dogs. I was walking my friend's two dogs, and we're like way up in the Klamath National Forest, and we we're in this little valley and there was like a knoll, like a small hill. And so I walked over to it cause I was curious. And then all of a sudden there was like 11 or 12 coyotes that came out of, you know, and they were barking, uh, doing like a, like a barking sound. And the, me and the dogs just kept walking and the dogs didn't bark back. Huh. They didn't, uh, they kept their tails down. They hmm. kept their ears down. They looked ahead, like whatever the coyotes were saying was uh, pretty intimidating. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no idea what the coyotes were saying, but the dogs heard them. And, you know, one, one of the dogs was a pit bull. They didn't want huh. any of that coyote mess. Huh. Yeah, it was really interesting. interesting. But they didn't charge us. They just, they got close and, and did the weird barking thing, but that was it. Hmm. Interesting. But, uh. So yes, a coyote attacks the rare too when people are eight, rare or non-existent. Yeah. So it's think... um. Go ahead. I don't. I don't. I. I don't know. If, I don't know if they're a problem at all. To tell you the truth. Yeah. 
and mainly again they're as far as like attacking and they're eating mice and rats and squirrels and rabbits um so yeah and fruit biggest part of their diet um people don't got to worry about them again where they were like what 30 pounds 50 pounds um yeah and again if we don't kill off the elders if we play it smart then um they're going to be taught as part of their kind of coyote culture to avoid people um but they're gonna be around us more if we kill off the elders and the young don't learn good lessons um and i get some of the same stuff i think there's some people who actually volunteers who go around kind of training coyotes to avoid people with um tennis balls um air horns stuff like that like i heard of, about that recently yeah was, we must have think, seen the same thing on facebook i think it was um um or maybe i don't know if you posted it and i got it from you but or hmm. or I, was, oh, I think it was maybe on I... some coyote page that i saw it coyote oh, probably project it. coyote yeah, yeah maybe it was there but uh so that's something people could do um bang stuff so we have them around to control mice and all that and um but then they avoid human places more um so yeah it makes a difference even reading some book about owls i'd have to look it up but someone was saying when there's owls around his house then the mice and rats aren't a problem there'll be some but they're very controlled Whereas if he poisons some mice and poisons some owls, that's when he's going to have a problem with the mice and rats. Yeah. And I don't remember what, it, yeah. what numbers it was, if he was during a year or just what the owl might feed its kids. But he was saying something about how he thought, I don't know how he got the numbers, but like an owl can eat like four or 500 mice. Um, so they're really picking them things off and really controlling them. Yeah, we just banned uh, rodenticides here too Good. in California. So, yeah, so that's going to really help because they were everywhere. Like there was rodenticides everywhere. And, and um, I definitely noticed um, a reduction in predators just from where I used to live. Like hmm. where I grew up as a kid, uh, we had owls, even though it was like, you know, pretty urban and suburban. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of owls and we had a lot of amphibians. And now you don't see either one like – you know, hmm. the amphibians are gone. I'm pretty sure it's because of Roundup, because hmm. um, the surfactant, the, yeah. the uh, chemical and huh. Roundup that helped you know penetrate the uh, leaves, cuticle, leaf skin, was also killing amphibians. We didn't know that until it was too late. Wow. Damn, and man. then um, there used to be there used to be owls in my neighborhood, and there's not anymore. And my dad was asking me why, and I was like, probably because all your neighbors are using rat poison. And he's like, oh, and I could tell by the look on his face that he was using rat poison too. Huh. So, um, hmm. you know, it's 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 a shame yeah again i think fundamentally goes back to education educational system needs to be reformed and i'm not the only one saying that people at johns hopkins a lot of other people it's been said there's even a documentary on cbs made in the 80s how we need to improve american education um and again that'll probably ruffle some feathers too but you know it's like i don't care i want things to be better yeah aren't good enough if you get your feathers ruffled by it well you're just against improvement and being better and having a better life, loving your kids, loving your grandkids, loving a better society. Um, that's not stuff I'm against. Yeah. No, but better educational system, teaching people to think better about the consequences and get more biologically and ecologically informed. Um, it'd just be to our benefit knowing stuff like that. And I think seeing cause-effect relationships like that are more on a level that junior high school and high school kids could get and find it valuable as opposed to some of this stupid DNA stuff. DNA is important, is relevant at a certain level for certain people, but you, no one in junior high school, unless there's some like super duper genius who's already known biology and ecology, they're not going to get science by studying DNA. You know? Yeah. And then in our modern world, they can find that on the internet enough as it is and get exposed and interested in science if it does to them. They don't need it in school. Most people need to learn really how to think better. Yeah. 
I know I, I, I often tell people that the other thing, if I was Jeff Bezos, I would pay everybody to take a critical thinking class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. I feel like that'd make a huge difference. That'd make a huge difference in our society. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's like so many of us are e- easily fooled by conspiracy theories. And, um, you know, it's sad. It's like people are people don't know what to believe anymore. And, um, and so they'll believe whoever sounds the most confident and they don't understand the scientific method and they don't understand scientific consensus. And so um, it's weird. It's like the other day I was thinking, you know, I could talk about conservation, you know, why we need to save biodiversity all day long for all the like ecological functions and, and, and ecological services. And that doesn't seem to resonate, but I bet you if I said that there was a group of uh, satanic pedophiles that were killing the environment and we had to, (laughs) and we had to stop them by planting native plants that I could probably get a bunch of people to plant native plants. (laughs) You know, it's it's like, it's like the more unbelievable something is, the more people are, you know, apt to believe it. And, um, you know, the less, the less evidence there is, the better. (laughs) Hmm. So like the more emotionally charged, you know, so it's like, or maybe, you know, I could make up a, a conspiracy that the Russians were um, trying to make us kill our own environment so that we had another dust bowl or something. I don't know. <laughs> like, maybe th- that would get people behind conservation. Yeah, human beings are complicated. Very, very complicated. But, yeah, so getting some things right is difficult. Got to get the social aspect dialed in. The independent thought thing. Get it to be both true and emotionally powerful and relevant to people's lives. Um, hell of a lot going on there. That's one thing where it's in the future of education also. All that stuff being figured out, how we could teach better, do education better. Um, that'd be a better part of teacher certification programs. Um, getting all that stuff dialed in so people in general and children are more interested seeing what they need as opposed to some of the stuff that's done now. But yeah, I think one thing I worked with one kid, um, tutoring him and his twin brother a long time ago. And one thing that really got him more interested in science, um, was making it real with him, not just doing the stuff that's in books. We did some math, some physics, some chemistry, but, in teaching them some physics, you know, the only way I roll is like, okay, look, we're going to know what the hell science is. So we talk about what science really is. And t- we talked about to make it relevant. Since I knew he was interested in cats, we talked about how to really know how the kind of lifestyle a cat needs, what it should eat. Uh, it introduced him to some actual scientific articles when he's in high school about what cat should eat and why, um, looking at what species is appropriate. Um, and he actually gave a presentation to some, in high school in an animal science class, gave a presentation to some uh, vets. And of course, they are taught by food companies that the cat should have a dryer or whatever. And he's disagreeing with them, but he was so well researched and well informed that um, none of them could um, pin him on anything or. Um, make him shut up. He actually, you know, like put them in their place. Wow. So that's more what we need. That kind of thinking, not so much putting adults in their place when it's appropriate, but you know, just good thinking in school. Anyway. Yeah. But So, um, I think my cat needs to eat and we've been going for a <laughs> while. So, um, Still a lot, a lot of stuff we could talk about, but uh, you got any last words for folks? Uh, I would just tell folks to um, that reading Doug Ptolemy's book, Nature's Best Hope, cool. uh, would be extremely helpful. And that I do live videos on Facebook at Griff Wild. So if you just, or you can just put in John Griff Griffith. And also on the Humboldt Redwood State Park page, I do live um Facebook's there. Facebook Live's there. That's where the Mount Line Facebook Live was. And I have a YouTube channel. Just put in John Griffith, and my YouTube channel will pop up. Cool. And I'll, put, I'll put links in the show notes for people. Make it easy. Um, find your stuff. Get in touch awesome. if they want. So, cool. 
and then get outdoors, everybody. That's get outside. Go for it. Is. Yeah. That's All what right. Start awesome. All right. Nice talking to you. Likewise. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for the discussion. Appreciate it. So. Right on. You have a good one. All right. You too. Thank Bye. you.